Happy Father's Day, everybody, and welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And I'm Kevin the Dad. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thank you. And this week, in tribute to Tina Turner, we are covering, is it the Ike and Tina Turner best of? Is the, that what? The best of Ike and Tina Turner. The you, best... you listened to this, right? Yes, I did. Oh, okay. You sure? <laughs> yeah, I did. Oh, okay. I just forgot the title for a second. Brain <laughs> fart. So, Dad, what do we need to know about Miss Tina? Well... We are going to do the Cliff Notes version so we can fit this all in one episode. You're welcome, listeners. <laughs> uh, Anna Mae Bullock was born November 26, 1939 in Brownsville, Tennessee, to Floyd and Sel- Zelma Bullock. She grew up in nearby Nutbush, Tennessee, and had two older sisters, Evelyn, a half-sister, and Ruby. The three were separated when their parents worked at a defense plant in Knoxville, Tennessee during World War II. Anna was sent to live with her paternal grandparents, who were a deacon and deaconess at Woodlawn Missionary Baptist Church. After the war, Anna and her sisters were reunited with their parents and moved to Knoxville, but moved back to Nutbush two years later. When Anna was 11, her mother ran off seeking freedom from her abusive relationship with Floyd, moving to St. Louis, Missouri in 1950. Her father remarried, and he and his new wife moved to Detroit, whilst her three sisters were sent to live with their maternal grandparents. Anna would move to St. Louis to live with her mother after Anna's grandmother died. She graduated high school in 1958 and worked as a nurse's aide at Barnes Jewish Hospital. Anna went to nightclubs in East St. Louis, and at the Manhattan Club, she saw Ike Turner perform with his band, The Kings of Rhythm. She was impressed and wrote that she almost went into a trance watching him play. She asked him to let her sing. He said he'd call her, but didn't. Hmm. So another night, Ike and the Kings were in town. Anna got hold of a microphone, and when Ike played B.B. King's You Know I Love You, she joined in. Ike was impressed with her strong voice and asked her if she knew other songs. By the end of the night, she had joined the band. She was one of many other vocalists who would front the band. She dated Ike's sax player, Raymond Hill, and in 1958, they had a son, Raymond Craig Hill, later Craig Raymond Turner. Also in 1958, Anna sang on her first record, an an Ike Turner tune called Box Top. She was called Little Ann. She later moved into Ike's house in East St. Louis, where he trained her on vocal control and performance. They had a close relationship, but then it got romantic, and then Anna became pregnant in 1960. Also in 1960, Ike scheduled his band to record his song, A Fool in Love. Vocalist Art Lasseter did not show up, so Ike had Anna record the song as a demo. Ike played the demo at the Manhattan Club. DJ Dave Dixon heard it and asked Ike to let him send the record to Juggy Murray at Sue Records. Murray was impressed, bought the rights to the song, told Ike to keep Anna's vocals on the record and to make her the star. Ike renamed Anna Tina Turner and trademarked the name, so if (gasps) Anna ever left... I could hire another female artist to perform under the same name. Oh, my God. Juggy Murray, I love that nickname, <laughs> um, suggested they call themselves Ike and Tina Turner when they were going to use Ike Turner and Tina, which makes sense. I had a better flow. It does. Uh, Juggy Murray got the nickname Juggy from his grandfather because he always had to fetch him a jug of wine. <laughs> anyway, A Fool in Love was a big hit when it was released in July 1960. It hit number two on Billboard's R&B chart in August and went to number 27 on the Hot 100 chart in October 1960. Ike formed the Ike and Tina Turner Review, which included the Kings of Rhythm, vocalist Jimmy Thomas, and the three of, and a trio of female vocalists called... What? Oh, I thought you know. The mm. Ikeettes. Oh, okay. More singles followed, along with grueling tours. Ike and Tina married in Tijuana, Mexico in 1962. The review would last for 15 years... Sometimes they'd play 300 dates a year during the hitless years. Whoa. Uh, notable highlights during this period was Phil Spector producing River Deep Mountain High, which did not become a big, the big hit film Phil had envisioned, and this signature hit in 1970, a cover of Creedence Clearwater Revival's Proud Mary. Mm-hmm. It went to number four and won them a Grammy for Best R&B Vocal Performance by a group. And in 1975, Tina starred as the Acid Queen in the movie version of The Who's Tommy. Mm-hmm. Did you get to watch that clip I sent? Yes, I did. That's some messed up stuff. <laughs> we'll talk about that a little later. Yes, you will. On July 1st, 1976, Ike and Tina got into a physical altercation en route to the Dallas Statler Hilton. Tina took off and filed for divorce. Among other things in the settlement, Tina got to keep her stage name. Good for her. She started appearing on TV shows 
and toured to pay off debts. She released a few solo albums that kind of went nowhere. But in 1982, she got a hit in the UK with her cover of Temptation's Ball of Confusion. In 1983, she signed with Capitol Records and got a hit with her cover of Al Green's Let's Stay Together. Capitol greenlighted an album. Private Dancer would be Tina Turner's huge comeback. The first single, What's Love Got to Do With It, went to number one and stayed there for three weeks. Mm -hmm. The follow-up, Better Be Good to Me, went to number five and Private Dancer went to number seven. The album itself sold 12 million copies worldwide, with 5 million selling in the U.S. alone. At the Grammys, What's Love Got to Do With It won three awards. Song of the Year, mm -hmm. Record of the Year, mm -hmm. and Best Female Pop Vocal Performance. Mm -hmm. Tina would also win Best Female Rock Vocal Performance for Better Be Good to Me. She would win that latter award three more times, a record that she shares with Pat Benatar and Sheryl Crow. Mm -hmm. In 2020, Private Dancer was inducted into the National Recording Registry for Preservation. She did a tour for Private Dancer, and I got to see her in July of 85 at the Civic Center. Really? Yeah, the insufferable Glenn Fry of the Eagles opened. Oh, oh. no. Oh, yeah. Um, also, in 1985, she played Auntie Entity in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome and recorded the theme, We Don't Need Another, Th Another Hero, Thunderdome. In July 1985, she duetted with Mick Jagger at Live Aid. More tours and albums followed. In 1986, she released her autobiography, I, Tina. In 1991, she and Ike were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Ike was incarcerated at the time, cocaine charges, uh. and Tina did not show up. In 1993, the movie What's Love Got to Do With It was released. Angela Bassett. Was Tina, and Lawrence Fishburne was Ike. Uh -huh. and there was more albums and more tours. In 2005, Tina got a Kennedy Center honor. In 2013, Tina married German music exec Erwin Bach in Switzerland. Three weeks after the wedding, Tina had a stroke and needed to learn to walk again. Mm -hmm. In 2016, she was diagnosed with intestinal cancer. Also in 2016, she collaborated with Felitta Lloyd on Tina, a musical based on her life. Yep. Does she have some sort of tie-in with uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber? Uh, I don't know. Why? Some Broadway thing. Her name sounds familiar for some reason. I don't know why. Wait, which lady? Philetta Lloyd. Uh, no, I don't think she's related to Andrew Lloyd Webber at all. Well, not related, but collaborated with him on any of his stuff. Not sure. Okay, anyway, while you're checking or not checking, Adrienne Warren played Tina. She was and amazing. The musical opened in London in 2018 and it opened on Broadway in November 2019. In 2017, Tina had kidney transplant surgery. Erwin Bach donated one of his to her. In 2018, Tina received a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. It was like one of the few times where like, she won Grammys beforehand, then she got the Achievement Award. Mm -hmm. Tina Turner died on May 24th at her home in Switzerland. She was 83 years old. Now, as for me, I'd always been aware of Ike and Tina on the periphery. I, at least I, I just knew Proud Mary, and that kind of was it. Um, Proud Mary, the best of Ike and Tina Turner, was released in 1991 on EMI. And it's one of the few compilations I know of in which the line of notes writer falls short of saying that some of the songs on this collection just flat out suck. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah, he didn't hold back. <laughs> um, other than that, the sound is great. The line of notes are very, very extensive and in very teeny, teeny, tiny print. Uh. And I think I got a used copy for Newberry Comics. It was one of those things where I saw it and thought, eh, you know, what the hell for, you know, five bucks? Yeah, it's worth a shot. Mm -hmm. So let's dive in. All right, first track, A Fool in Love. From that first woe, if you never knew Tina Turner was a singer, that one word would be all you need. And then with her vocaleses, you understand why she was called the queen of rock and roll. Listening to this song is a bit yikes in retrospect when we all know about the abuse she suffered nowadays. Her vocals almost distract you from how the lyrics hit the nail on the head a little too well. The backup singers are great, but they're to accent Tina. I don't even pay attention to the lyrics, just the rockiness of her voice. You know a singer is great when you eventually stop caring about the lyrics and just start savoring their voice. Great opening to introduce someone to her talent. Huh. Ike wrote this song, so maybe it was like, um... Yeah. Maybe he knew it was going to come down the road. Anyway, I, I listen to this and I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that okay. Tina is still trying to figure out, uh, oh, wait a minute. Tina's trying to figure out how she acts like she does when her man treats her badly, and she's hanging on still. 
So A gets, I think, act like a Greek chorus and they fill her oh, in okay, with the that. title. And um, when I first, the first time I heard the song, I could not believe it was Tina Turner singing. And I listened to the song and I still can't believe it because like her voice, I mean, her voice has always been kind of raw, but this is like really, really raw. But, you know, then again, so was Holland Wolf's. And mm. I kind of get the feeling and correct me if I'm wrong on this. I kind of get the feeling that she was learning how to sing while on the job. It was like know. almost like on the job training. It doesn't sound like it's hurting her, though, which is the good thing. Yeah, I guess, because to me, it's like I listen to this compilation and it's kind of like you can hear her singing progression uh, song by song. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's just me. Mm -hmm. I think it was just the, you know, ooh, with the yelling and the shying, I thought, oh, my God. This, mm -hmm. I can't believe this is the same person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next track, I Idolize You. Okay, I'm going to juxtapose this song with Hopelessly Devoted to You. So in that song, Olivia Newton-John is trying to suppress her feelings, and you can tell she's about to give in, and it's hopeless to resist. Her innocence is being crushed. Whereas with Tina, she is a grown-ass woman who is a woman of the world and is in her power and her truth. And you get the feeling that if this powerful woman is into you, man, you have hit the jackpot. And at one point, she gives off a little bit of dominatrix vibes, saying how she'll make this man her pet. You could do a strip routine to this easily. Bless, Bless me. And I was starting to question my sexuality a little bit the more and more I listen to her. Forget him, baby. Come right over to me. What a powerhouse. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it does sound similar to a fool in love, like like backing track wise. Um, I figure, you know, they got their first hit with that and Ike was not going to mess with the formula. Mm. This time, Tina tells her man she can give him lugging, loving, and she can hug him too because, well, you know, see the title. My favorite line, and you touched on this, is, ooh, what I would get if I could comfort you and make you my pet. Mm -hmm. The mind reels. Yep. And to me, Tina belts out this song to the point where it makes her performance on The Fool in Love seem sedate. Mm. She's just, like a lot of this early stuff, she's just like balls out. Yes. And like you said, I, I never realized that before, but she's she's not hurting her voice. No, she's not. Next track, I'm Jealous. Oh, Tina, he is not treating you right, and it's not jealousy. Kick his ass to the curb. My favorite comment under this video said this. Love doesn't exist. Quit being jealous over silly relationships. It's not worth it. Single is the one to go. Less stress. Be like me. You'll be happier, and you won't have to give up the cookies. <laughs> she was like, okay. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Cookie? <laughs> One other thing I want to talk about with Tina's voice, screaming without hurting your voice is difficult. I don't know how she did it, but you can tell that these screams are fueled by passion and emotion. But the ending sounds like she's living her experience with Ike as she pleads saying, you know I love you baby, and that part makes me sad, but also happier that she was able to leave him and find happiness on her own. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Musically, I'm Jealous sounds like early Motown. And then Tina starts singing and you realize no way Barry Gordy would have released this song on his label in a million years mm. or maybe even longer. Tina's tossing and turning in bed all night because she had a dream someone else was holding her baby tight. And the green-eyed monster, that's jealousy, not the Incredible Hulk, yeah. raises its head. More belting? More belting. Sure. Focally. Mm -hmm. Maybe physically too. Oh no. Hmm. Next track, it's gonna work out fine. Is it? My first note, oh no, he's here. Ike's acting here is something else. That's me and- Have I got a surprise for you? Oh, it's not Ike? It's not Ike. Okay, well, okay. That guy's acting here is something else. That's me and you must be losing your mind. Had me grimace and chuckle. <laughs> Tina's reassuring, you know, it's gonna work out fine, which, oh, the irony. But in the song, he gets swept up in the positive emotions. She went to see the preacher, and now they're talking about getting married, and her ecstasy only builds from there as she and this guy reminisce about their relationship. But I don't think I could listen to this song over and over since I'd just be thinking of Ike, which would give me the ick, especially with <laughs> Tina especially with Tina calling him daddy. I'm like, okay! And I listened to that other version you sent me with uh, Keith Richards and Ronnie Spector, and that one was fine, but this one is more fun just because of the cheese balls acting. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, especially the way that uh, 
He says that line. That was my plan all along. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that's not Ike singing with Tina, which I always thought it was, but it's not. That's Mickey Baker from Mickey and Sylvia. And their big hit was Love is Strange. And Sylvia is playing guitar in the song. Did I, I sent you Love is Strange, right? No. I don't know. I don't remember. I don't think it was did. the clip from uh, Badlands. Oh, yes, with yes. Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. Yeah, I just wanted to figure out what the hell was going on in that movie. I was like, what's this movie about? Well, I know it's based on the Starkweather case. What's that? Where I think it was, well, Martin Sheen, I believe he plays Carol Starkweather. He picks up a girl and they just go on a killing spree. Jump in the car, oh. drive across the Badlands, bangity, bangity, bang. The one thing that I couldn't get over was how much he looks like Charlie Sheen. He was so young. I don't know if that was his first movie, mm -hmm. but man. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Tina Tina has plans. She tells Mickey, er, er, Ike, in, I'm using the quotation fingers here, mm -hmm. that she went to see the preacher man. And I thought, preacher man, you must be losing your mind. And started making wedding plans. Started what? Absolutely hilarious. And Tina sings really well on the verses. Come the choruses, she's full throat. Holy crap. Some mm -hmm. of her, and this is not meant to be an insult, but it just reminded me, like, some of her screams, it sounds like a cat with it, that had its tail stepped on. Yeah. yeah. And this song has been covered a lot. And I sent you the Ronnie Spector Keith Richards version because that was the version I first heard. Okay. And that came out in 2006, and it's not a bad version. And, you know, you really have to listen to, to Keith, to Keith's responses, because he's in full mumble mode. Yeah. But even then, it's it's hilarious. It's like, what's he saying? Preacher man. Yeah. It's like, it's right. like Pete from Steamboat Willie. <laughs> yeah, before Pete could talk. <laughs> all right, next track. Poor fool. Tina has a message for all of us. Mind your own business, because this man is hers and no one else's. And if you don't like it, then you've been a fool too long, because she'd do anything for him, including drive a missile. This was the track that made me realize I want to hear Tina Turner sing Twist and Shout. If that exists, please send it my way. I like to think it would. Yeah. Yep, so she serves notice. You should tend to your business and leave hers alone. She sings about how this man is hers. And I like the line, she'd give him Prussia if it could be bought. Mm -hmm. yep. I know if Prussia was still around back then. I'm not sure. Anyway, meanwhile, those who apparently are not minding their own business sing that she's a poor fool, been a fool too long. One of them's right. We'll never know who, but my money's on Tina, though. Mm -hmm. Next track, Tra-la-la. La-la. -la. Tina loves her man so, but she's blue and feels all alone, so she's going to sing. As a singer who struggles with their mental health, I'm here to tell you, singing works. There's an exercise Julia Cameron uses where you just sing your feelings to random notes until your emotions are released. And if I don't do that, I put on my mood-boosting playlist. These are all songs curated to make me happy and feel better, and it's great for relieving stress. Tina seems like she's more in Group A. Although I, didn't, I don't believe she'd sing Tra-la-la for one minute. Maybe it's code for swearing. Needs a more adult phrase here to make it work. And also, I can't hear Tra-la-la without thinking of the beast from over the garden wall. You know how you'd hear him sing tra la, -la in the woods? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so she's walking along, singing the song, but not side by side. Because she's so blue. And that song mm -hmm. is tra la, -la. Mm -hmm. and, But I noticed that the Ikeettes do more of the tra la la than Tina does. And there's a nice muted trumpet solo. And right after that, the Ikeettes are singing do 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 a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's... To the point where I think they're like almost marking time, trying to stretch out the song just a little longer. So maybe it makes the three minute mark. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely more singing than shouting from Tina on this one. And I kind of wonder if, if this might have been influenced by Otis Redding's sad song. Because his thing is like, fa, 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 fa. That's his sad song. But then he came up with the sequel, Happy Song. Dum dum dee 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 dum dum. Okay. So it could just be that, or maybe this song influenced them. Like I said, I don't know the timeline off the top of my head. Okay. Next track. You should have treated me right. But you didn't. Tina does a high pitched scream here that made me go, oh my god, I can't believe she did that. And I'd heard her scream a bunch already, but damn, 
I wonder if she played this song when she got a divorce. Maybe not. The collab would bring back too many bad memories. This is more of a happy dance for leaving someone who doesn't appreciate you, even though she still loves him, I guess. Maybe at the end you could turn this into a seductive dance with the holding and squeezing, but the messaging and the music don't really match for a chunk of time here. Yeah, I don't think she would have played this once they got divorced because it was almost like once they got divorced, that was it. Yeah. It was like no contact. When he died in 2006. Nothing. Nothing, nothing online, nothing at all. Yeah. It was just, you know. I remember, what was it? Uh, an interviewer on CNN tried to get her to respond to something Ike Turner said and she just wasn't biting. Yep. She refused. Yep. Yep. So musically, I think You Should Have Treated Me writes a lot popular than anything that's preceded it. And the title pretty much says it all. Tina's telling her man he had her, he lost her. But now she's found someone else. He, But now she's found someone else, he wants her back. And the Ike gets spent the last minute of the song sa- singing Should Have Treated should have treated Me Right over and over and over whilst Tina freestyles. And then she wants that guy to tell her how much he cares for her. And she wants him to hold her and squeeze her and tell her that he loves her. And she wants to hold him. And I'm thinking, is it the new guy? Or is she just teasing the guy that lost her? Or is she willing to give him a second chance? It's kind of an ambivalent ending there. And now we leap from 1962 to 1970. The intervening eight years were spent hitless in the United States anyway. Um, the Ike and Tina Turner Review, like I said, would spend 300 nights on the road some of those years just to keep the act going and to keep solvent. Um, they wound up opening for the Rolling Stones a few times, and their performance of I've Been Loving You Too Long, I know this writing song, was in the Stones documentary Gimme Shelter. And that appearance opened them up to a new audience, the college students. Ike, <clears throat> excuse me. I capitalized on this um, by the recording of the next song. Come together. Oh, I love the key this is set in. It's so hauntingly beautiful. If Tina wasn't cemented as the queen of rock and roll at this point, I'm 99% sure this track did it. She practically outscreams John Lennon. I think if he tried to outscream her, he'd strain too much to the point of taking a dump. And I gotta <laughs> admit... This isn't my favorite Beatles song. Like, it's it's great, but I don't go nuts for it. However, I go nuts for Tina's version because she leans into the groove, puts it in neutral, and lets it rev, bringing out a richer side to the song. A perfect cover that's better than the original. Although I will say, when I searched for this on Spotify, the first track that popped up was her recording, which I guess was used in that god-awful Cruella movie. That movie didn't deserve this track. Huh. Yeah, I that, had no idea this was used in that song. Yeah. I and mean, this song was used in that movie. Yeah, huh. that surprised me too. I'm like, where the hell would you even fit that? And it was Tina's version? It was Tina's version, yeah. Huh. I guess for some reason they thought, this is a good movie about how Cruella's mom was killed by a bunch of Dalmatian dogs, and that's why she hates them for some reason. Did they eat her? They chased her off a cliff. <laughs> but the dogs were smart enough to stop before rolling over the cliff themselves. Yeah, it turns out that the fashion lady that she's working for in London, those were her dogs that chased her mom off the cliff, I guess. It was basically trying to be like the Joker movie with Joaquin uh, Phoenix, I guess. Okay. It's weird. I'm glad I did not sit through that craptacular. Me too. I just read the summary on Wikipedia. Oh, okay. I was like, okay, this is as bad as I thought it was going to be. Anyway. So a month after the Beatles version came out, uh, I and Tina started performing their version live. And a studio version came out in December of 1969. The playing's pretty faithful to the original, I think. But did the Fab Four have Tina? No, no they, they did not. not. And that's what separates these two versions. She does a great job. Mm-hmm. Next track, Honky Tonk Woman. According to Urban Dictionary, a honky tonk woman is a lady who works at a bar, either as a dancer or as prostitutish. And I guess this one has a particular set of skills. Skills that Tina lewdly hints at with her rocky voice, as you imagine what she does to the bar drunk and the gentleman from New York. My favorite lyric is, he blew my nose and then he blew my mind. Gentlemen on the streets, a rake in the sheets. Aw, yeah. (laughs) As for the Rolling Stones, uh, (laughs) hold on, Dad needs a minute. Okay, go ahead. As for the Rolling Stones, the cowbell had to grow on me, not gonna lie. 
but the drumming and guitar are great with the slight tempo increase. As for Mick, he rocks here, and it is just as lewd, but compared to Tina, there's no contest. What I will say, though, is that the harmonies here are perfect and sound great, so I can definitively say I like both for different reasons, but the well-oiled musicality of the machine that is the Stones puts it just over the edge. Well, they did do it first. So, yep. yeah, this is a cover of the Stones classic. And this version is just as good. Tina is feeling it. She is the honky-tonk woman of the title. And she definitely made the song her own, especially by singing it in first person. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Stones, obviously, it's in third person. Yeah. Um, she changes a few words here and there. Instead of give me the honky tonk blues, it's give me a honky tonk man. She knows what she wants and she's gonna get it. Oh yeah. Next track, I want to take you higher. My first note, whoop whoop whoop. <laughs> Cause there's whooping in the background. Okay. From the synths. And with this, we are in the thick of the 70s. It's funky and rocking at its best. If you don't like Tina Turner after hearing this, there's no hope for you. I just hear this song and I want to dance and dance until I have nothing left to give. As for Sly and the Family Stone, the music just possessed me. Structurally, it's very simple, but the music played over and over and catches you in its spell and I loved it. Perfect song, both times. They are one of my top three great American bands of all time. Who are the other two? Uh, Queen's Clearwater Revival mm -hmm. and Talking Heads. Yeah, I had a feeling Talking Heads would be in there. That would be an unusual concert billing. It would. Could it work? I like to think so. Mm. Um, so, believe it or not, Ike and Tina's version actually did better than Sly's version on the Billboard charts. Oh, really? Yeah, his peaked at number 38 and Ike and Tina at 34. And this is a good version. I have no problem with it all, but Sly and the Family Stones is unbeatable. I like both. Next track, would that be Working Together? It would. And here we have Tina's protest song. Tina asks everyone to try to love for a change. And would you dare oppose the Queen of Rock? Apparently some people did, because we still don't have world peace after this song came out. But she's sincere as she sings it. Her singing isn't as intense due to the subject matter, and maybe it's because I missed her more rocky vocals that this song didn't do anything for me. Pleasant, but doesn't stay with me. Ike wrote this, and it says, Can't we all just get along song? Well, he couldn't get along. <laughs> It's mid-tempo, and it is a bit of a mishmash, and I kind of wonder if Ike was just pandering to the hippies. Yeah, he might have been. With this song. I, I, I kind of think he was. Cashing in on the peace movement. Yeah. Yep. Next track, Proud Mary. This is the musical equivalent of foreplay, starting off nice and slow and sweet, and then bam, kicking it into high gear. The video was very 70s, with the dated green screen, outfits, and editing, although the outfits were great. And my favorite part this time isn't Tina's singing, but how unhinged the musicians get. As for Creedence Clearwater Revival, I've loved the original since I was little, and every time it played on the oldie station driving back from Fall River, I just listen along and jam. I just love this one the most, maybe because I heard it first, but I love the country twang in Creedence Clearwater Revival's version, and the guys sound great in melody and harmony. And then there's the cover by Beyonce at the Kennedy Center Honors. She didn't come to play, she came to kill. This is from someone who loves Tina and wants to do her music right. You can tell she meant the world to her. And the tribute was pretty solid. The dancing in that one is better than the 70s video, though, especially those back bends and high heels. That was impressive. I thought her singing voice was okay. okay. Like it, it almost seemed like a little too polite. Like, well, compared to, to Tina's version, I mean, Tina just goes all out on this song. And I thought Beyonce mm. was... was not really holding it back, but just that her style was different. Okay. That's all. Um, this is the longest song on this collection at 4 minutes and 56 seconds, and every second counts. But first. Okay. Creedence Clearwater Revival's original version came out in December of 1969 and made it all the way to number two on the Billboard singles charts. And CCR always had the bad luck of hitting number two and being stuck behind some really crappy song. What was it this time? I can't remember. I have to look, but that ha they had a lot of number twos, and you looked at, like, what was number one, and you're like, oh, man, I can't believe it. <laughs> um, they actually got their first number one. I think it might have been 
I don't know if it was 2021 or 2022, something called the Billboard Digital Singles Chart. I don't know what that means, but mm, they hit number one. Anyway, um, this is the song they will always be known for. John Fogarty wrote about leaving a good job in the city, working for the man every night and day. He leaves it all behind, hitching a ride on Proud Mary, a riverboat. And I think his language evokes Mark Twain and, mm. and Life on the Mississippi, that book that Twain wrote. Anyway, we jump ahead two years to December 1971 with Ike and Tina's, when Ike and Tina's version was released. And it sounded nothing like the original in any way, and they truly made it their own. And the opening is classic, where Tina informs us that some people mm. would like to hear them do a song nice and easy, but they never, ever do nothing mm -hmm. nice and easy. They always do it nice and rough. Mm -hmm. But as a compromise, they're going to start Proud <laughs> Mary nice and easy, and then they're going to finish it. <sighs> yep. And do they ever. Mm -hmm. The song starts calmly enough, then explodes at the 2 minute and 19 second mark, and it's a masterpiece. It got so popular that even when Tina performs solo, she will do it. Mm -hmm. And like Credence, Proud Mary is the song Ike and Tina will always be known for. Now, the thing was like, Years later, when John Fogarty was performing solo, he said he would never play CCRR songs because of all the legal issues. Because at the time, he did not own the rights to his songs. Oh. So if he performed him, someone else was going to make money, not him. Oh. But he did get the rights back in 2004 when I believe it was Concord Records bought the Fantasy Records label. So he got those rights back in 2004, and he got the global rights back in 2023. Oh, good. So he's doing all right. Anyway, someone, and I wish I could remember who it was, told John Fogarty that he needed to perform the CCR songs because people were going to think that Proud Mary was an Ike and Tina song. Yeah, yeah. And eventually he did stop performing the Creedence songs again after he had an epiphany at Blues Man Robert Johnson's gravesite. And when your mom and I went to see him, in Boston at what used to be called Harbor, Harbor Lights. I think it's the Bank of Boston Pavilion now where it's changed the name so many times. Anyway, he did do the Creed and stuff and it was great. But you know what? Most people think this song's title is Rolling on the River. That's what I thought when I was a kid. Next Welcome track. to the Inside Club. <laughs> Next track, Funkier Than a Mosquito's Tweeter. Some odd similes here, but the anger is palpable. Tina has had enough of this dirty old man's BS, and as the song says, he's not slick, he's just another brother, which, ouch. Tina is getting funkier here, and I love the song, but I find myself missing the earlier rock tracks. It's fun for a few minutes, but not one of her best. Tina's sister Aileen Bullock wrote this song about Ike. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> she was not too fond of the man at all, and it's a great diss track. You're nothing but a dirty, dirty old man. You, you're thinking with, with a one-track mind, and his rap's dusty, his lines are rusty, and my favorite line, you think you slick, but you can stand a lot of greasing. Did he ever find out this was about him? I don't know. Maybe, I'm sure he probably did at some point. And as to what the mosquito's tweeter is, I leave that up to you. Mm. It's, the, it's, it's a stinging implement. Which end of the... Anyway, uh, great that. great 70s funk track. I, I like this song. Okay. Next track, Ooh Poo Padu. That opening piano sounds like it came from Franz Liszt and is very impressive. If they got a classical pianist for this track, then they showed their chops very well, and I want to know who's playing it. But after that, the lyrics are childish. Ooh Poo Padu just feels like a cartoon substitute for sex, and while the music and singing are adult, I can't take the rest of the song seriously from the title on, and I'm mentally checked out till the next track. As for Jesse Hill, those opening vocals got my attention right away. And then as soon as the dance music kicked in, I was vibing with this one, uh, with this, with this one way more, because it's got a dance groove that just grabs a hold of you and never lets go. Way better than Tina's. Sorry, ma'am. And those line dances from the Banana Festival were very cute. Yeah, that was impressive. Yep. Yeah, so Jesse Hill wrote and performed the original in 1960. And Ike and Tina's version starts off with almost a minute of classical sounding piano. And yeah, I'd like to know who did that too, because someone definitely did their homework. Um, and then we go into the song itself. 
And, you know, their version's not bad, but, you know, you hear Jesse Hill's original and it's definitely a lot better. And you need to hear both parts one and two. And you also have to go on YouTube and type Upu Padu Line Dance because it's just great. That big guy in the front with the hat and the yep. shorts, yep. he is like, he's got to be the leader. He is just, mm-hmm. he is just great. Next track. I'm yours. Use me any way you want to. I do like how this song has a ballad for the bridge, which is an interesting choice. But then she references higher and higher, and I wish I was listening to that instead. The horn section sounds great, too. And other than that, I don't have too much to say about this song. I wasn't too into Tina begging for a man this time around. Yeah, I think the title pretty much sums up the lyrics. And the song's okay, but nothing really revelatory here. Not bad. No. Next track. Up it here. Up it here. Tina turned back for the church after a man made her fall into sin. She regrets it now, but she says, given the choice, she'd do it all over again. Although, is that Ike singing up in here? That is. It scared me, and it unsettles (laughs) me, because it's just jarring against all the music. Maybe he's supposed to symbolize the devil here, which, (laughs) that'd be applicable. Interesting story, but Ike throws it off too much, which is sad, because it started with that kick-ass guitar solo. Uh, This is the first song Tina wrote. She sings about how, when she was a girl, she learned about the son of evil in Sunday school. And then Tina meets him, and hand-holding and smooching ensue, and then her family disowns her. She must have held hands a little too well. Mm. So she becomes the daughter of evil, and she's trying to get you up in here. Um, Ike ships in with his bass vocal on every up in here, and the song is messy. There's a lot going on, and it ends too soon, but I love it. And I just love his bass vocal. And yeah, it is a little off in the timing, but that's probably intentional. Mm. Next track, River Deep, Mountain High. Mom played me this song all the time. I'm sorry? She had this played at Kathy and Henry's wedding dedicated to me, and I was like, please, not this song again. (laughs) But it is very sweet. Tita says she loves her man more than the little rag doll she had as a girl. The vocals in this are beautiful, especially how they drop off at the end. It's pure ballad, and it works here. And when I hear this song now, I don't dread it anymore. I smile. As for Phil's version... There's some additional vocals in the background, and I don't really think they're needed here. The strings added are lovely, but I think the original is fine, and Phil's additions aren't needed. They're nice, don't get me wrong, but I wouldn't miss them if they were gone. But the vocals toward the end are gorgeous, and they take you aback for a great final touch. Uh Uh, This was written by Jeff Barry, Ellie Greenwich, Greenwich, and Greenwich, Greenwich, sorry, and Phil Spector. Um, This was going to be Phil's masterpiece. 20 more musicians played on it, and it cost $22,000 to make. A mere pittance at the time. It's just a little short of $200,000 in today's money. It was released in 1966 and went all the way up to number 88 on Billboard Singles Chart. And Phil was so distraught, he withdrew from public for two years. Why didn't this song do well? Uh... Because it's not that great a song. That's oh. what. Yeah, I'm I'm going against the tide here because I find the production is overblown. And for a Phil Spector production, that's really saying something. Oh. And Tina just sounds out of her element. Um, like like her voice is like smothered by Phil's orchestration. Like she's really trying to overcome it. And the lyrics are... I'm going to say it, they're dumb. When you were a young boy, did you have a puppy that always followed you around? Well, I'm going to be as faithful as that puppy. Ugh, Tina is too much of an adult woman to be singing this. Don't tell mom that. And that line, I love you like a schoolboy loves his pie. Oh, I forgot that lyric. Double, ugh. No, nah, she, she, she's, she's experienced too much, Tina's experienced too much life to be singing these innocent teeny bopper love lyrics Mm. they should have gotten someone else maybe it would have worked with darlene love better i don't know Mm. but um licensing issues prevented the original from being released on this collection and i bet alan klein had something to do with it was he a producer no but he at one time owned um phil's catalog so it was like all for me and nothing for you. you yes um this version is a 1973 re-recording that appeared on Ike and Tina's Nutbush City Limits album. And this remake isn't doing anyone any favors because you just can't overcome those dumb lyrics. Mm. But 
I do like it better than the original though. It's not as fussy, it's more straightforward. Okay. Next track, Nutbush City Limits. A town being named Nutbush has to be the most southern thing ever. Did you know there's a dance contest to this song in Australia? I've heard about that, yeah. Yeah, look it up. For a song about a small southern town that most people didn't, didn't know existed, this song rocks. And the guitar playing here, my god, I love this song. Makes me wish Tina did a country collab on this. Uh, yeah, so she, there's another song that she wrote, this one about her hometown. And the thing is, she doesn't, use, she doesn't need to use a lot of words to paint a picture of Nutbush in Tennessee. And it made it to number 22 on the Billboard singles chart. And after Ike and Tina split, Tina reworked it from a funk rock song into a harder rocking number and became a staple of her shows. It's a really good song. Mm -hmm. Next track, Sweet Rhode Island Red. Did Miss Tina sing a song about Rhode Island? Yes, she did. Okay, it's not actually about Rhode Island, but it's her nickname the guys call her. But those notes on the keyboard are just too high-pitched. They put my teeth on edge. Compared to Nutbush City Limits, Nutbush is way better. It rocks in the same way, but I feel it more with Nutbush since she was actually from there and has more passion. Okay, this was written by Tina for the 1974 album of the same name. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a hard-charging number. And Tina is the Sweet Rhode Island Red. Why or how she got that nickname is unclear in the song, but who cares? I'm sure there's a good reason. And <laughs> I love the line where she sings, she's 34, 38, and 22 at the tummy. Um, it just missed the top 40 by three spots. I Ooh. love this song. And why it's not our state song is beyond me. I was just thinking that too. I think it's a toss up between this and Rhode Island is famous for you. Oh, that should be our state song, Rhode Island is famous for you. As for the fowl itself, the Rhode Island Red is a dual purpose chicken. Yeah. You can use of eggs, which they can lay up to 200 to 300 brown eggs a year, and you can eat the chicken itself. Allegedly, it's good eating, and it's like a really, it's probably the most common breed of chicken out there. Mm. So chances are, listeners, you've, you've enjoyed a Rhode Island Red. Um, the bird itself was bred in the 1850s in Little Compton, Rhode Island, and yes, it's the state bird. Yep. We, we have a chicken <laughs> as a state bird, and believe it or not, there is also a Rhode Island white, which, again, dual-purpose chicken, making with the brown eggs, but, you know... Rhode Island Red or Rhode Island White, Rhode Island Red. Just mm -hmm. rolls off the tongue easier. Yeah. And we also had the Rhode Island Reds hockey team, minor league, t minor league hockey team back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then eventually they became P the Bruins. P Bruins. Mm -hmm. Yep. Next track, Sexy Ida, part one. Sexy Ida is the ultimate forbidden fruit. One kiss from her is the kiss of death from Mr. Goldfinger. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, they really crank up the funk in this one, and I have the feeling the funk was more Ike's idea than hers. It's not awful, but the funk becomes distracting from the song and the powerful vocals. Should have been more sinister, like the title song from The Kiss of the Spider Woman. Okay, you can go on to part two, because I kind of mushed parts one and two together. Okay, Sexy Ida part two. This one is better than part one, because it has the perfect mix of funk and rock, and Tina can let her rocky vocals show. I think that those backup singers could have kicked in about a minute earlier, though. Even with the improvements, I'm still not satisfied. That high-pitched whistle comes in and ruins it for me. It's the same song twice. Uh-huh. Kind of, sort of. Um, it's just in different musical environments, settings. Uh, part one is a funkier version, and part two is faster tempo, and Mark Boland from T-Rex is on guitar. Mm -hmm. um, Ida is the human embodiment of a black widow spider. She wants your love, and then your life. Could be worse, she could be the praying mantis, where she wants your love, and then she bites your head off. Mm. And the chorus to me, has always been kind of problematic where it's don't give your love to sexy Ida because she's the sister of a black widow spider. And if you give her your love, you might as well give it to the spider. And I thought, I guess there's not a lot of words that rhyme with spider. You cider, have to stretch it out. Cider. Wider. Biter. Rider. Ooh, biter. Decider. Yeah. Decider. But I just could not come up with a better line. Rider. Wider. Uh, maybe, you know, you might turn to cider. Hide her. I don't know. Um, I'm, 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 anyway, I'm sorry. It's, it, it's, they're okay songs. Next track, Baby Get It On. A dance track duet between Ike and Tina that I just didn't have the energy at this point that I had to be invested <laughs> in. Compared to Tina, his singing voice is meh. And it's better if he just sticks to background or cameos. If I had more energy, I might enjoy it more. 
Yeah, Ike's on lead vocals for the most part because this is the best of Ike and Tina. Um, and Ike's been waiting, he's been waiting doggone long, and he's ready to get it on. And Tina does call him out. I met your likes before, and I bet you turned chicken. <laughs> <laughs> the song has a lot of thump to it, I'll give it that. Not bad, not great. Uh, thankfully, Tina jumps in to save the day. Final track. Acid Queen. I pity any actress who ever tried to play this role on stage after Tina. And speaking of, may I tell you how the stage version did this? Yes, please. Okay, so in the movie, Tommy is taken to see the Acid Queen, who puts him basically in an Iron Maiden that injects him with multiple syringes. And the best parts are the absolute look of horror on Roger's face and when his cane goes flying across the room. Now, when I saw it on stage at Bristol Theatre Company... Basically, the Acid Queen became a little too interested in the kid Tommy, and then as soon as the dad saw her start to whip out some illegal drugs, he grabbed Tommy by the hand and got him the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. Huh. Now, Tina and the Who work really well together, and she made this track forever iconic. That's it. That's all I okay. can say. Yep, this is from the Who's Tommy, and Tina played the Acid Queen in the movie. And really, who, who else would you want in that role? Mm. Would you believe the first choice was Mick Jagger? Nah, that but the thing was, he wanted to do his own song, so they said, nah, we'll see ya. Mm -hmm. um, so Tommy's parents leave him with the, with the queen in hopes that she can cure him. Mm -hmm. And she feeds him drugs and uses her feminine wiles on him, but no luck. So, you know, so much for tearing his soul apart. Mm -hmm. um, Pete Townsend said the songs about how society teaches that if you're not drinking or drugging or sexing enough, society in some way can force it all on you. And the Acid Queen represents that for us. Hmm. Um, Ike did not produce this song. And you can tell by the way it sounds because it really rocks. Yep. And there are other versions by Patti LaBelle and Bette Midler. But I just cannot imagine anyone else doing this song. Yeah. And Tina definitely took this song um, from The Who and made it her own. Um, Acid Queen was released in January of 1976, and Tina would divorce Ike later that year and keep on keeping on for seven years before she made her huge comeback in 1983. And I gotta say, that clip that I sent you from Tommy, yeah, Roger Daltrey does a really good job of, of, yeah. of being like, you know, blind. Immobilized but scared as hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very impressed with his acting. And Tina, you know, impressive, very, very impressive. And the thing that got me with the Iron Maiden was I'm um, watching this thing and I thought, oh, my God, some prop department guys actually had to create this to thing. To build that, like, yeah. All the needles had to go in. <laughs> all the needles had to come out. And then all that red liquid, like, had to flow. And I thought, oh, my God, I hope everyone made their money back on this thing. I don't know. It's a cult classic, so maybe eventually it did. I don't know. I think it's one of those movies where I think... I should probably watch it again, but then I don't know if it would, like, impinge on my memories of seeing it when I was 12 years old. I don't know. Oh, you don't yeah. want the nostalgia to go away? Like, like, my memories might be better than the actual movie. Oh, I see. Okay. All yeah. Right. Yeah. Because, like, you know, when it starts off, you see Keith Moon and his Uncle Ernie looking in, and I thought, wait a minute, what the hell is he doing? He shouldn't be there. Yeah. Anyway. Overall, Tina Turner is awesome. I found a lot of new songs I like listening to her, and now I understand why she's the queen of rock and roll. So glad we did this episode so I could learn more about her and her body of work. I just wish that I really appreciated her when she was alive. Overall, this is a de de decent, 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 decent compilation. Uh, it's pretty much all the Ike and Tina I'd ever need, and I think you might need. Yeah. Um, I like that it's in chronological, chronological order, and you can... Definitely hear Tina progress from a shouter to a singer. And as for her solo stuff, um, really all you need is private, the Private Dancer album because that is a classic. Now, I want to get into a debate with you. What? Because you keep mentioning this phrase. And who, who really is the queen of rock and roll? Tina, next. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've always looked at it as... Oh, uh, was Pat Benatar? I was going to say Joan Jett. Oh, Joan Jett. But see, that's the thing. It's like, you know, with, with, with King of Rock and Roll, it's always been easy. It's always been Elvis, even though I think over the years it's that Chuck. opinion is starting to change. But there's like so many, I mean, you, there's so many candidates for Queen. You got Tina, 
Chrissy Hine, Stevie Nicks, Pat Benatar. Well, who came Joe first? Jet, um, the Chicken Eat the Egg. Um, Tina's could, first chronologically, so she's a pretty rock and roll. Case closed. Well, if you're going to go um, chronologically, you could throw in Wanda Jackson oh, okay. or Janice Martin. They both started back in the 50s. Rockabilly, rock and roll. Um, Wanda Jackson's big hit was Let's Have a Party, which um, I have Led Zeppelin doing a version of that song, and I also have the Go-Go's doing a version of that song. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I think that's always kind of kind of be up for debate, I suppose. Like, everyone has their own opinion as to who that is. I'll go with Tina. And for, for me, I'm, I'm just always going to go with Joan. All right. Okay, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment and my dad listens to this. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Because remember, the more you interact with the video, the higher chance we have of being seen on the YouTube homepage. If you follow me on social media, I post the episodes there. If you're friends with my dad, shoot him an email with what episode you want to listen to, and he can send it to your inbox. And as always, if you like what we do, feel free to leave a contribution in the Ko-Fi tip jar. As always, thank you for listening to Lace and Stolen and my dad listens to this. We'll be back next time with another album to pick a grip about. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Anything you want to say before we sign off? Two things. For our next episode, we uh, might have someone who could also be a candidate for Queen of Rock and Roll. And lastly, rest in peace, Acid Queen. <laughs>